This is called A Course in Miracles, an introduction. So at face value, I am going to assume that nobody here, or at least many people here, don't know anything about A Course in Miracles. So this is starting completely from scratch. Uh, so it is an introduction. So what is it? It's that. It is a book. Or actually, it's three books. This is the... This is a first printed edition of it, which came out in, uh, around 1975, 1976. And for the, the, the early editions, uh, all came in these three volumes. Um, and what these volumes are, I will explain in a minute. Um, but about 10 years later, the publisher started publishing it in a um, one volume edition. And, uh, You'll notice it has the same blue cover, um, but this you'll see it says combined volume here. This is a this is a pretty recent edition of it, and it has all three of those things in it: the text, the workbook, and a manual for teachers. Now, I say this because if you ever buy a used copy, um, you without looking at it too much, you might just pick up a stray volume. You know, say it's something that says it'll just it'll say workbook, but um, you know if you're not really paying attention, you know you could have just been buying one of the three volumes of the course. It should have all of those in it, uh, you know, for it really to be complete. There are a lot of editions of it out there, um, uh, and that would be way too technical to go into. They're all basically. I actually wrote a little monograph on the difference in these various uh, versions. Um, about 10 years ago, called a comparison of miracles, um, but I'm not going to go into that now. Th these are this is just that's just too uh, that's just not for a talk like this. And um, you know, basically, all the editions out there are fine. Um, I personally prefer this one, which was basically the only edition that was actually sanctioned by the people who put it together, um, whom we'll find out about momentarily. But there are lots of others. Uh, and as I say, it's a long story. You know, it's not it going to hurt you to do any of the others, but um, then some of them might be a little harder to work with. If, if anyone's really fascinated by this topic, uh, you know, you can ask a question about it. As usual, I'll speak for a certain amount of time, and if you have any questions or comments, you know, just wait till the end because there's plenty of time uh, to deal with all of those. So, so that is a course in miracles physically. Um, This is what it says about itself. This is a course in miracles. It is a required course. Only the time you take it is voluntary. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. It means only that you can elect what you want to take at a given time. Free will does not mean that you can establish the curriculum. Well, that sounds kind of frightening, but if you actually look at the, what the Course says, um, the reason that that is the case is um, your capacity for suffering may be great, but it is not infinite. Sooner everybody needs to find a better way. course does not aim at teaching the meaning of love, for that is beyond what can be taught. It does aim, however, at removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, which is your natural inheritance. I, in any case, I want you to just pay attention to this, removing the blocks to the awareness of love's presence, uh, because that is um, obviously a major part of what the course is about, and um, how it does that, and what it is meant to be about. Um, is a very, very major theme. The Course can be summed up very simply in this way. Nothing real can be threatened. Nothing unreal exists. Herein lies the peace of God. That, what you've just seen, is from the first page of the Course. Where did it come from? Who wrote it? Well, I'm going to explain to you, if you don't know already, about a phenomenon called channeling, 
This is a fairly new term, you know, that is over the last generation or two for a phenomenon that has gone on endlessly over the course of history. And it is basically uh, a person hears an inner voice, which he or she does not identify with himself or herself personally, and writes down what this voice has to say. Uh, it, it is an inner voice. It, it's, it's usually heard kind of in your head and not as a uh, as an auditory hallucination. I, I don't know of any cases where it's like that. So you know, it is a voice inside your head or this person's head. Um, and there are a lot of channel texts. There is a course in miracles, as we know. For those of you who are familiar with Jane Roberts' Seth material, um, that is uh, also channeled. Uh, there's several books of that. Um, here are a couple slightly more obscure ones. The Arantia book, some of you may have heard about, which also a channeled text, which has, you know, it, it sort of says what department of the, of the uh, you know, bureaucracy of the universe Earth is in and that kind of thing. I have a copy, but I... Never really been able to get another. And this weird one called a wasp bay, which is almost completely forgotten. It was uh, channeled in the uh, 19th century. And the guy who uh, channeled it um, used that newfangled invention called a typewriter to uh, write it down. And you can find it. A lot of occult bookstores still carry out it. Nobody, to my knowledge, reads it anymore. And um, it's kind of a, a little thing that fell by the wayside. It just occurred to me that I could, of course, add another book to this channel text, which would be the Quran. Because Muhammad said it was dictated to him by the angel Gabriel. So that would also be a channel text. There are lots of others. Um, there's a Kabbalistic work called the Zohar uh, in the 13th century, which is probably a channel text. Uh, again, you know, that would be a, source, a topic for another lecture. So, who did it? Well, these are, these are the people who transcribed it. This is the woman who actually heard the voice. Her name is Helen Shuckman. And this is her colleague, pal, sometimes adversary, Bill Thetford. Now, these two knew each other because they were both professors of psychology at Columbia Uni uh, University Medical School, which is not really the typical kind of person that um, is often associated with such phenomena. Um, they realized, like all academic departments, their department was like, you know, very, very fraught with the usual hostility. You know, Henry Kissinger said that um, academic infighting is so intense because the stakes are so small. And that probably was like that. And finally, they looked at each other one day and said, there has to be a better way. Now, sometime after that, Helen started hearing this inner voice. And it said, this is a course in miracles. Please take notes. <laughs> and, you know, she, th th she was more or less an atheist. So this was not exactly something that was, you know, bound to pop out of her head. Um, she didn't really know who to talk about this to. So she went to him, Bill Thetford, uh, and said, you know, look, I, I think I'm becoming schizophrenic because I'm hearing this voice in my head. And uh, he said, well, you don't really show any of the symptoms of psychiatry. Remember, these people were, you know, qualified medical professionals in this sort of thing. Well, you're not really showing any of the signs of schizophrenia. So she said, what should I do? He said, well, why don't you just write down what it says? And that ended up being these 1,200 pages, which took, I think, about six years to transcribe. It was an inner voice. She took it in shorthand. Uh, he typed it up. Uh, and, um, you know, for a long time they did not circulate it. Um, it was around 72 or 73 they started to put it all together. Here's another picture of them. This is Helen. This is Bill. Um, this is Ken Kenneth Wapnick, 
who helped them, who served as kind of an editor for it, uh, and Judy Scutch, who, who kind of um, supported it and promoted it. Um, Helen died in 1981. He died, and Bill died in 1988. Ken Wapnick died, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and Judy is still alive and well, although very old. These were not people who uh, um, were hyper self-marketing new age types, right? Quite the opposite. You know, before she died, Helen, you know, was meant talking about her memorial service. And she said, well, for God's sake, don't mention anything about the course, because my friends will be there. <laughs> um, she really didn't, you know, she didn't even tell any of her friends about it. Uh, you know, it's published, but her name, at least in the, the editions that were published when, her, uh, her name, when she was alive, her name is not on it. Now it will say, this one has a little introduction that said it was scribed, and that's the way they use this process, the scribal process. Uh, it does actually mention their names. Um, uh, I, I never met her. She died in 81, which is when I started uh, meeting. I, I never really, I never met him either. Bill Thetford, I met at a couple of uh, Course in Miracles groups in um, California in the early 80s. He was a very uh, pleasant, mild, understated man who did not even lead the groups that um, I met him at. He was there. And obviously, people treated him with a lot of respect, but um, he certainly in no way ever uh, attempted to make himself like a guru. Judy's, I say, is she's still alive, and she was running the foundation for Inner Peace, which published it until recently, because she's old and she's turned it over to her daughter. But um, she's a nice lady. I exchange emails with her every now and then, and um, uh, she's she's been very complimentary about my work. So these are the main people who are involved in it. Um, so who who dictated? Well, who dictated it? Well, it was a voice that said to be that of Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with that? Um, that certainly makes it sound a lot crazier, <laughs> than even it may have sounded up to that point. Um, is there any, how, but there's of course no objective criterion by which you could determine whether this was dictated by a person known as Jesus Christ or not. Why? Because there's no criterion to com compare it with. Every reputable New Testament scholar, every reputable New Testament scholar who's not like a fundamentalist um, will say, the New Testament, the Gospels contain many things that Jesus did not actually say or do. This was already known, by the way. This is always known. And I talk about it in my book, How God Became God. But you can't really, and Jesus in the Course says, well, the apostles got a lot of things wrong. And yeah, well, the scholars kind of say the same thing too. Uh, which in the Gospels is, stuff in the Gospels is authentic, and which isn't is like quite another uh, question. But you can't really go by that. So, you know, if you want to, you know, you know, if you're a real Bible-based Christian, you want to say, well, this isn't, this is, the course isn't in line with this. You're, you're perfectly right. It isn't. It's not. Um, uh, end of discussion or not, as you like. Myself, I have no particular opinion on the matter. Um, I will say that it is a very powerful and comprehensive teaching. Uh, I would say it's uh, the greatest spiritual text of the 20th century. And it presents the only actual, actually coherent and consistent Christian theology I've ever seen. Because um, confidentially, the idea that God sent part of himself to get tortured to death down here to somehow make it up to himself because somebody ate a piece of fruit in Armenia 6,000 years ago does not, in my mind, constitute a coherent and consistent theology. But let's start with the teachings of the Course. This is actually a line from me and not from a, a Course, which man is the animal that believes something is wrong. Right? Something is wrong. 
There's ISIS, there's Donald Trump, there's global warming, there's this, there's that, there's inequality. Notice, if any of these problems goes away, some other problem, equally alarming or more so, will just come up in its place. I mean, the world is problematic. Um, your idea of what the problem is and my idea of what the problem is may be completely different, but it's all, everybody sees the world that way. A lot of people like to say, well, you know, it's our advanced material culture that's really, you know, messed with our minds. And, um, you know, if we can only go back to the simple, you know, life in the jungle that, you know, the natives have, um, everything would be nice. Well, this is all well and good, but if you actually look at those native mythologies, they themselves think of something's wrong. There was always a time when the gods were with humanity, and then humanity became so insufferable that they left. Practically every uh, mythology uh, has some strata that. There's some, like, problem, some kind of failure. The Buddhists, you know, would, uh, you know, say it is illusion or maya. Um, Every religion has its version of it. This is what is called in Christianity, the fall. Of course calls it the separation. Now, again, I think, you probably won't be surprised to say that the story of the fall of man in Genesis is not literally true. But it has a great metaphorical or a metaphysical truth to it in that, um, well, you wanted to know good and evil, so this is what you get. You get a world where you experience good and evil. Um, I warned you not to do this, God said. So here you go. Here you got it. There, you will see a lot of Christian terminology in what I'm about to say. And A Course in Miracles does use Christian terminology of the familiar sort, but it, it uses it in a very different way. So although you will have heard all of these terms before, um, you really have to set aside um, what you think they mean from, again, conventional theology, which this is not. This is the way it originally was. God the Father created God the Son. Who's God? Well, God. Who's the Son? Us. We are all the Son. Of course, says God has only one Son. So again, you're seeing right now, again, this is not quite the Trinitarian theology of the creeds and so on. And that is creation. That is the way it's supposed to be. But then something happened. Something came up called the ego. The ego. And this is the term the Course uses. Uh, the Course never to my knowledge, ever uses the e word ego in a positive sense. The ego is always the problem. And what is the problem? Your sense of separateness from God. You cannot be really separate from God, because this is the way it is and this is the way it still is. But you can think you are. And that is what is called the ego. And it is the source, the um, cause of, shall we say, all of what's wrong, the sense of being separate from God and from one another. That is it. That is the problem. That is some, the something wrong, according to the Course. I mean, there's a, a course has lessons, and I'll, I'll get into that later. But um, you know, one of them is, is let me let me recognize the problem has been solved because that's all. There's only that problem. 
And it's solid because it isn't real to begin with. So God created what is called the real world. So this is the real. You can quibble about the word real, and, and there's some, you know, yeah, it's not physically real. It's not materially real. But it is real in the metaphysical sense. Uh, in, in the metaphysical sense, usually when you say something is real, as in, you know, Hinduism and many other schools, what you're really saying it is eternal and unchanging. The unreal is that which is constantly passing, con the constant, the shadow play of existence. And this, this is found everywhere. Um, like, say, for example, Plato's Republic. Um, but in, you will also remember the thing in the Upanishads that says, lead us from the unreal to the real. Famous statement. So the ego, which is delusory, it's, one, it's characterized at one point as kind of a, uh, you know, a tiny, insane voice created the world, which is this world, which is why everything is so awful or seems to be awful, because it's delusory, it's against the will of God, and it's unreal. If it were real, if God... God what God creates is real, according to the Course. If God created it, um, it's there. If He didn't create it, it's unreal. This is your own delusion, my own, our collective delusion. I mean, it will even say God does not know of the world, because if God knew of the world, what God knows is real, and then that would make it real, which it ain't. So, the real world, what is the real world? The real world is not like this, meaning this one. There are no stores where people buy an endless list of things they do not need. There is no day that brightens and grows dim. There is no loss. Nothing is there but shines and shines forever. That is the real world. And it is not the world I see. Right? Here's some early lessons in the course. Again, I'll, I'll explain what these are. Nothing I see in this room means anything. Why? Because what you see is, is this world. I do not see, understand anything I see. I am upset because I see something that is not there. I see only the past. Now, these lessons are very early and they're very brief because people sometimes find them sort of depressing. Um, but of course, that's not the, the place. Uh, it stops, it stops, it says, well, this world isn't real. Beyond this world, there is a world I want, which is this. And how it is attained, um, we will get to. So this is the way it was fixed. You know, you see the Holy Trinity, right? Just like in the Christian creeds, we've already seen two, God and the Son, which is us. Now, the Holy Spirit in the Course's language is the bridge that enables us to go past the ego canceled out and kind of be restored to our um, rightful relationship. So it's not um, anything like the um, Christian Trinity, as I say, although, I mean, the thing about its use of Christian terminology is that it is explicit, explicitly, uh, as the scholars sometimes say, revisionistic. It's using those terms. Remember, Jesus is at least allegedly talking. You know, yeah, here are these terms. They've been used wrong. I'm using them right. And as I said before, um, this is, it is consistent and clear and coherent. Um, you know, it can be a, it, it can be a lot to wrap your mind on. It certainly requires a huge reorientation of thinking, 
but it is clear and consistent once you kind of understand it. So the Holy Spirit, in fact, is called the atonement principle. What is the atonement? Well, showing that this doesn't really exist and that we were never separated from God at all. That's how you do it. Which may seem rather odd, but we've already said the ego wasn't real. The ego is a delusion. The world, uh, as we see it, is not ultimately real. So, here we are, the sun in separation. So, why forgiveness? Well, none of this ever happened in an ultimate sense. Now, it's not saying that this didn't, you know, events don't happen on the, 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 the plane of time as we know it, but it is saying that this plane of time and space is illusory. Um, so, if all of this is illusory, <laughs> Nobody ever did anything wrong. All the wrong people do are here, is, is here. Everything. Let me see if I can find something here. Lesson 14. God did not create a meaningless world. part of the lesson. God did not create that war, and so it is not real. God did not create that airplane crash, and so it is not real. God did not create that disaster, specify, and so it is not real. Yes, yeah, it does feel real. It does feel real. I mean, one has to say that. Um, but it is possible to step beyond this level of reality and move, according to the Course, into the real world where this sort of thing doesn't happen. In fact, never happened. Um, and, well, why? How do you do it? Well, you forgive. And forgiveness is not so much um, a kind of sanctimonious pardoning of other people. You know, ever notice that, if, you know, people actually say, I forgive you, it, it's, there's often something kind of obnoxious about it. It's like, I forgive you. You know, yeah, who are you to forgive me? Oh, by the way, those people who did those things to you, they're not even different from you. The idea of these people are different from you is part of the whole thing. And that's why, you know, it's the ego, right? Um, it's hard to grasp. And it's not going to be terribly easy to grasp without some experiential component, shall we say. Until you kind of get there, it, um, you know, it's going to seem a bit factitious or... Um, contrived. So, forgiveness is a refusal to see what never happened. This whole world is, you know, delusory, um, and so it didn't happen. So don't get upset about it. Um, people will say, well, you know, if I don't get upset about it, you know, people, you know, nobody's going to do anything. Notice, just note, I mean, read the news, and I'm not giving any examples because I really don't want to get people's minds sidetracked onto this. Go tomorrow on the internet, the New York Times or whatever uh, news site you like, and see how many of the problems today are attempts to, um, the result of attempts to solve problems in the future. In the, in the past, excuse me. Um, if you are, shall we say, doing this kind of fixing the problem from an ego's perspective, you're just going to create more problems. And that, in fact, is what we have, right? Every problem um, solved creates another problem. I am really strongly to give, exam give examples from current events, but as I say, uh, 
I don't want people's minds sidetracked to that sort of thing. This is something quite different. And uh, if nothing else, I hope you came here to get away from that nonsense for an hour or two. So, remember this? That's from the introduction. I, it was a thing I said to remember earlier. Well, that's what it is. Love is always present because God created it. And nothing is going to change that. Um, but you can block your awareness of that. And the whole world, as known now, uh, is pretty much uh, you know, attempt to block that. It's, almost, it's interesting from almost from like a psychological point of view to see you know, how it's done. But um, notice how everything always has to be somebody's fault. You know what the problem is, right? Everybody agrees about this. It's them. They're no damn good. If it wasn't for them, everything would be great. Everybody in the world believes this. They may have a, a slightly different definition or concept of who this them is, but everybody fundamentally agrees about it. And as uh, the spiritual teacher Gurdjieff once said, sooner or later it ends in people breaking one another's heads. Which um, hasn't changed much, even though he said that a hundred years ago. So that is the um, way of going about it. I mean, there's more to it than that. But uh, I'm not going to go any further into kind of the theory of it. This is quite enough for one uh, evening. Instead, I'd like to go and just talk a little bit about um, how you actually would work with this material. Um, and as I said, there's a text, there's a workbook and there's a manual for teachers. And this edition gives you a, the relative size. This is pretty thin. This is the thickest, and this is in between. Uh, the text is a long 600-page theoretical discussion of this. Um, the workbook, it consists of 365 lessons. And where should you start? This is, this is what the course itself says. It would seem, you know, if you just took this at face value, um, it looks as if probably the best thing to do is to read the manual first, because it is very short and concise. And then maybe the workbook and then the text. Practically everybody does it the other way around. And the text is very, very, um, it's hard to get into unless you have some experiential sense of what's going on from the workbook. I mean, I bought these books uh, in 1981 as a curiosity. I read an article about it, about it in the course in Psychology Today magazine, and um, I saw a set for sale at a used bookstore. I thought, well, I'll just kind of have this as kind of a fun curiosity to have. And I, I took them home and I started reading it. I got about 20 pages into the text, and it really did not uh, register very much with me at all. Um, but then there was this workbook, and the lessons were, um, you know, kind of easy to do. So I found that this is the most useful way of doing it. This is not the course's own uh, idea. This is my suggestion from my own experience and seeing the experience of various other people. You can start anywhere you like, as it as it just said, right? But yeah, I think you know, starting with a workbook is probably the best. Um, and simplest because it um, requires the least understanding of theory at the outset. Obviously, there's a fair amount going on there. This is, there's a whole theological system there, which, as I say, is very profound. But um, you know, it would be a very big uh, pill to swallow in a single dose. So to start with these lessons, which are, are you know, particularly at the beginning, extremely brief, is a much more realistic way of getting somewhere with it.
So, this is again the directions. The exercises are very simple. They do not require a great deal of time, and it does not matter where you do them. They need no preparation. Training period is one year. The exercises are numbered from 1 to 365. So I guess that would kind of mean do one a day, huh? Uh, do not undertake to do more than one set of exercises a day. That's the only specific uh, thing. Now, well, can you spend more than one day on a given lesson? Um, yeah, you can. I mean, it doesn't say not to. Um, my advice generally is to try to stick with that. If you're really going to do it, to stick with a one a day um, thing as much as you possibly can. Because it's very e easy to say, oh, I didn't really do this one right. I mean, I did this one, but I, I, I didn't really do this right. Maybe I should do it again. Oh, I don't know. Maybe not. I just, I don't know. Maybe forget about it. Just, okay, I did this lesson one day to the best of my ability, very likely imperfectly. But rather than kind of strain myself to kind of get it right by doing it over and over again, which I believe is be counterproductive, just, okay, I did it that one, I did it, let's go on. Um, in fact, it even says, it talks about teachers of God. And um, in the context of this course, it says, um, you really, no business calling yourself a teacher of God unless you've gone through the workbook. I don't necessarily think it's a great idea to run around telling everybody you're a teacher of God, but some, some people are into the course to do. They can tell you a few funny stories about that. But anyway, the, 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 this is really the experiential core of it. And although the, the lessons are a bit disorienting, you know, they end up, you know, becoming much more inspirational. Today I learn to give as I receive. I am entrusted with the gifts of God. There is no cruelty in God and none in me. I feel the love of God within me now. There is no peace except the peace of God. Today I will judge nothing that occurs. I am in danger nowhere in the world. So, although it starts in a very disorienting, nothing I see means anything kind of way, that's a fairly short section and it does become much more uh, inspirational and um, quite powerful. But again, you know, the, the sequence has some meaning. Um, uh, you know, if you've, once you've gone through the workbook once, well, can you do it over again? Yeah, people do. I mean, I have known people who every January 1st started all over again. But as they used to say on um, the old chat rooms, why MMV? Do they still say that? Why MMV? Your mileage may vary. So, so follow the directions very specifically, you know, and um, the directions are, are quite clear. Uh, you, you can do them anywhere. Some of them, you know, particularly it gets, gets on, uh, you know, they, they require a little bit more time. Um, but, um, you know, as you know, most of life is just simply following the directions. Um, Here's something to leave you with. There's one thought in particular that should be remembered throughout the day. It is a thought of pure joy, a thought of peace, a thought of limitless release, limitless release, limitless because all things are freed within it. And that's from the teacher's manual. So I would say, if you want to take away anything, whether you do the course or not, um, uh, this might be a nice thing to take away from it. And um, as you all know, exactly how you visualize this or, you know, whether you visualize it as light or peace or love or something like that, um, uh, it's a really a matter of your disposition. I think some people might agree that this would be a very useful thing to project into the world right now. I'm going to stop here with my formal um, presentation. Um, you know, I, I basically, you know, gave you a sense of where it is, who it came from, you know, some of its basic teachings, and at least some, 
attempt at orienting you for um, uh, going into it if that's what you want to do. So um, as I say, I'm done with the formal side of it, so just ask and comment as you like. Uh, thank you, Richard. Could you just, uh, just explain a little how you would do one of those exercises? So it's, they sound quite brief. You, you read it. And is the instruction that you try and recollect that throughout the day or that you contemplate it or that you repeat it? Or what do you do with it? Um, well, the early ones are very brief. I mean, you just do this for two or three minutes you know, maybe once or twice a day. Um, like lesson 13, the exercises for today, which should be done about three or four times for not more than a minute or so at most each time. Um, so, you know, these very early lessons, which are the more uh, disorienting ones, uh, you know, a meaningless world engenders fear. You know, there are only two emotions according to the course, you know, fear and love. Fear is the product of the ego, and love is a, is the creation of God. So that would be it. I mean, there are later ones that, um, here's lesson 43, three five-minute practice periods are required today. One is early and one as late as possible in the day. The third may be undertaken at the most convenient and suitable time that circumstances and readiness permit. That's that one is entitled, God is my source, I cannot see apart from him. And, you know, toward the end, it becomes a little bit more free form. I and mean, the, the idea is just, you know, you're given an idea and you're, um, you know, to kind of sit quietly in a meditative state. So that's a rough picture of how it works. Uh, if the world is illusion, illusionary, then why is it so important to look both ways before crossing the street? <laughs> it's a webcast question. Oh, the, uh, the, the ego, according to the Course, uh, made up one other little thing, um, and that is the body. That is the physical body. The physical body is the result of the ego. And the only thing that can really happen to you can happen to the physical body, right? All danger, all pain, all fear, everything is around the body. Why are you so anxious about money? Well, because, hey, um, if I don't have enough money, you know, when I'm old, I'm, the body is going to starve. The body is going to have no place to be. Um, so the body is the whole source of the preoccupation. Um, of course, no one is suggesting that one violate common sense. Uh, but on the other hand, um, there is some point in just in, in um, setting aside kind of compulsive fears, and you know, um, yeah, maybe you may be necessary to look. Uh, um, while crossing the street, but um, go through your mind because 95% of the thing, minimally, the 95% of the things you're afraid of, worry about, all that sort of thing, are simply never going to happen. But in a way, and this is the whole thing going back to the ego, but your whole identity is um, shall we say, coagulated around them. Because the ego is made up of fears. So, of course, would say, you know, it's wise to discard fear as much as possible without um, doing anything crazy. Um, you know, so you need, it said, you, you need neither be uh, unusually careful nor careless. If you, shall we say, you know, function along with some kind of sense of being centered in this way, um, things will take care of themselves a lot more than um, uh, they would otherwise or would seem to otherwise. So, yeah, you're still going to have to cross the street. Uh, look before you cross the street. That is, that is the case. Um, but in the real world, 
There are no streets to be crossed. This is a world where, you, where the ego made up all these sorts of things. And this can all be set aside. I mean, it does talk about miracles, right? And what is a miracle? Well, it's anything that kind of takes us past this um, sense of ego, uh, ego separation. Um, the very, very first thing in um, the text is there is no order of difficulty in miracles. One is not harder or bigger than another. They are all the same. All expressions of love are maximal. Now, that again is sort of like a big pill to swallow, or would seem to be. But it follows logically, you know, from going back to this, um, you know, if this is all unreal, in a sense, there's no um, partial unreality. It's either real or it isn't. What does that mean? And this is an, an image that um, the Course uses very often. Let's put it this way. Um, it's no harder to wake someone from a really bad nightmare uh, than from a mild nightmare. They're both, they're both illusions. And, you know, and as I say, this, this image is used constantly. Well, you woke up and you saw it was completely unreal, you know. What was it? But, you know, when you were in the dream, um, it certainly felt real. You know, if you feel, I don't know, you're being chased by wild animals or something in a dream, yeah, it feels real. The fear you feel actually is, is as big or maybe bigger than it is in waking life. But that does not impart, shall we say, reality to it. The body, the only value the body has is as a tool uh, for learning in this context. When you've learned what you're going to learn in this realm, you just drop the body and, you know, just like throwing away an old coat. That is from the individual point of view. Yes, there is a need for a collective awakening. And it will happen because, you know, to go back to what I said earlier, the tolerance for suffering is not infinite. And it even has a name for this. It's called the last judgment. Except God will judge everybody, every last person. And the verdict will all be not guilty. You thought you could be separate. You thought you could be separate. You can do all sorts of horrible things. You can, as we all know, you can easily put yourself in hell. Easily. There are people who are living and walking around in hell now. And um, uh, sometimes you can tell who they are and sometimes you can't. You can do that to yourself. But... It is ultimately not real, and everybody has will realize this. In terms of time, well, who knows when. The miracle, which is, shall we say, some gesture toward the atonement or some act of the atonement, um, does something unusual, according to the Course. It eclipses time. That is to say... If you learn the lesson now, you can save yourself thousands of years of misery. And it is pretty, you know, it is quite simple. Basically letting go of your grievances. There's a, a lesson that says, um, let miracles replace all grievances. Because one thing about your grievances um, that I can say infallibly is that they're making you miserable. Just the way mine have made me miserable. <laughs> 